Okay. So um, it's just 12.30 p.m. Central European summertime. Um, and uh, we're about to begin the session, our session today. I don't see that we have anyone who's joined in terms of um, an audience, but uh, we are recording this. Uh, our session today is on public private policy of SDG development. Uh, as I think everyone knows, the Sustainable Development Goals were uh, developed and published by the United Nations in 2015 with a goal to achieve them by the year 2030. Uh, these goals were 17 in number, which led to a, a number of 169 targets around each of these goals. And the goals spanned everything from no poverty to zero hunger to good health and well-being to peace, justice, and strong institutions and a variety of topics in between. Now, when these, de these development goals were first um, published, uh, there was no uh, an anticipation that we would have a pandemic in the years 2019 you know, to the current. And as a result of that, there have been a lot of stress stresses on the systems, on the system, not only, you know, maybe activities that were being performed to advance the goals may have been interrupted by the pandemic, but in addition, the resources that were available to um, towards um, getting to these goals uh, have potentially had to be uh, moved uh, into other priorities. And so the, the question now becomes, uh, with the deadlines now only eight years off, and with the fact that these projects, the 17 goals, 169 targets are quite diffuse, how can we actually achieve these goals? One thought is that uh, the only the one way to do that would be through the public and private um, segments of society working together to do that. Um, and so the questions are, what's a good uh, route map to initiate and control these PPP plans? Uh, which are the most critical PPPs to initiate? Should some be truly international or do they need to be more regional? And so there are a lot of topics, subtopics around this, um, spe these specific points. And we have a, a very esteemed panel with us today. Um, we have Hak Hakan Oshanjak, who is at the uh, American University in the United States. We have Fernando Galindo, who's coming us uh, from Vitalis. And we have um, Matoya Kitamura, who is the founder and chief executive officer at North Village Investments in Japan. Uh, there are a couple of other panelists who I know are having a difficult time trying to get into the, to the platform. Uh, it's going to be difficult for me to <laughs> uh, try to solve the IT problems and, and, and also to chair this panel. So I'd like to get started, given that we have about 45 minutes. And so what we're going to start off is with Matoya Kitamura, who has some thoughts around, you know, he's, he comes from the financing community and invests in businesses. Some of these businesses are actually have an SDG orientation. And so uh, maybe Matoya, you can give us some thoughts about, as you're looking at investment opportunities, how do the SDG uh, the sustainable development goals factor into your investment decisions which is an important part of doing a PPP, for example. So I'll turn the floor over to you. Maybe you can just uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and then um, give us your thoughts. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I, I, as I was introduced, I'm in the private equity investment business. Um, and I've been here for, uh, in this industry for many, well, at least 20 years, 25 years. I don't even remember. <laughs> Before that, I was with a think tank, and I started my career as a as a journalist as well. I've been in the panel of um, Rasis um, for at least five years, as, as far as I can remember. The second one for the global one. We have a we have a would be participant <laughs> in the panel. I think. Okay, that um, like, that's Daniela. <laughs> yes, it looks like her. Yes, yes. But, uh, um, so, you know, I, I can't say that I have a direct experience in the PP, PPP or SDG, but SDG and ECG is a big, big buzz, buzzword in private equity as well, believe it or not. And, and it was initiated 
um, from the, the investors who invest in private equity funds, uh, and especially the pension funds. And, and you know where they're coming from. They have this public mission that they need to publicize. Uh, and, you know, they're public money in many, in many ways. So they're very mindful of how the money is used. Um, not only for the international re- uh, sorry, in, uh, investment returns. Uh, and because of uh, these investors, the managers have become very aware of how uh, they are mindful of um, the ECG angle uh, of the investments that they make. Um, I was in the investor side, sort of standing in between the manager and the investors. And whenever we wrote investment papers, um, or the managers that we sort of guided their investment into, we had to spend some pages uh, in, e- in ECG. Uh, and this, this, was, this happened around 10 years ago when we had a public pension fund uh, an investor um, back uh, in Australia, actually. So it is starting, and it's been um, a big part of our business. Needless to say, the investment destination um, that uh, uh, the funds of private equity are um, are making, they they uh, cannot sort of avoid uh, addressing uh, the ECG angle because uh, it's one of the big checkpoints of the manager that that invests uh, in, um, in these companies. So it is a big part of ECG. I'm not sure if that's your in, intuitive understanding of what how private equity um, sort of um, manages to do business, but it is. Uh, and from our point of view, uh, one, I mean, the, the, the spirit of the, the UN um, um, project is, is a very respectful one. And I agree completely that an international organization like UN should should take an initiative in this field. But from our point of view, I mean, one of the questions that I would raise is that, does it have to be a UN? Uh, because we already have this ecosystem in the private sector, uh, which sort of includes and incorporates uh, the, 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 um, the managers of public money, like the pension funds or uh, the um, sovereign wealth funds that manage public money who have this, these initiatives and who make it a rule, almost a rule, as de facto standard to, uh, to manage their money. If we have that ecosystem, uh, you know, what role would or should the UN take? And it is there, is there a role for UN to take? Um, so if we don't meet these targets, I mean, is it such a disappointing it's, is it a disappointing thing? Uh, and it, is, it, is, it is disappointing for the UN, but, you know, is there any, anybody else who's playing that role? And I think there is. Um, I mean, not only the private equity, but there's, there's also um, a role of cryptocurrency where you can raise money, raise capital uh, from a social angle, from a moral angle, ethical angle, quite easily. Um, and there's also... Um, funds that we call impact funds uh, that have a new role in, in, in the ecosystem. So we have different kinds of rules, uh, tools that manage uh, in, uh, public money for, for the same um, mission that the UN pro- program uh, is sort of advocating. Um, there is also um, some negative factors in PPPs. You know, we all know that, you know, many Many players in the private sector uh, take advantage of the cheap financing and lazy monitoring. They understand, and that's that's why they they um, take advantage of it. And it's that's a, that's a dark side of the PPP, and and that's why we haven't seen many uh, successful cases in PPP. Let's say in Japan, for example. Um, on the other hand, we have very successful cases like SpaceX and NASA, and I'm not sure if you can call it a PPP, and 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 and, you know, be comparable to what we're talking today. But that's one successful case of where the private sector worked very well with the public sector uh, using the PPP initiative. So what can we learn from that? I think that would be the hint. But in general, PPP has been, um, you know, at least what I see in Japan or some other parts of Asia, um, misused 
uh, quite intentionally by the private sector. So we we must find a way to avoid this if we were to, you know, take advantage of the goodwill that's been advocated by the UN. I want to stop here uh, and um, listen to, to to my fellow panelists um, because I, I'm sure people have many angles to discuss about when it comes to this topic. Okay, thank thank you, uh, Matoya, uh, for those comments. Um, I know we're having some technical issues, but it looks like we have all our panelists here now. Um, let me move to then Akin, uh, who has some thoughts around this topic, especially from a net zero perspective. So maybe Akin, you can introduce yourself and then uh, make your opening comments. Absolutely, thank you, Gary. You can hear me okay, right? Despite the technical problems. Um, so I'm the working for the American University as a AVP of Media Relations and Communications, but I also sit on the Council of Advisors of a nonprofit in Washington, Washington Institute for Business, Government, and Society, which previously I was working there as their executive vice president as well. I have um, pretty extensive experience working on uh, PPPs in many areas, including cybersecurity, um, artificial intelligence, and even in the area of sports and impact, how you know business and government have to work together for the betterment of society. As far as SDGs are concerned um, and sustainability in this year, that's actually a really interesting area uh, that I've been focusing on. Um, recently, I was in, in Qatar um, for some projects and I really saw firsthand the serious kind of attention that they're giving to the issue of net zero. This is from both the uh, private sector, but also the public sector. Um, you know, for example, Qatar Airways, you know, wants to be you know, the, the airline that is basically the most sustainable, like they are really um, determined to go with that zero. Uh, this is part of Qatar's Vision 2030, which, of course, can be well aligned with the SDG goals for 2030 as well. So it's in a really interesting area. My alma mater and university that I work for, American University, is actually also the first uh, carbon neutral university in the world. So it's not just that, you know, governments... And, you know, the private sector have to take the lead in this. I think academia can play a really important role as well. So that's why I cite, you know, the example of American University in this case. So that's, that really is an area that I think we need to focus on and can continue. So not just, you know, get, having a get together at COP and come out and talk about, you know, climate change and sustainability. But how do we actually have that? Just like, you know, a few years ago when the business roundtable came out and talk, talked about stakeholders and shareholders, how important this you know, for us to work together on that front. Same thing that I think sustainability and climate change has to continue to be top of the agenda because it's not only, you know, good for the world and the environment, but it's also smart business. So that's the first point that I want to make. The second one is um, maybe not thought of as much, but it's the role of artificial intelligence in SDGs. Um, there was a really interesting study. I mean, it's a little dated by now, but still uh, from nature in 2020, how especially AI can play a really important role. And they looked at it from the perspective of how many of the goals, the SDG goals can be met with the help of artificial intelligence. Um, and I think it was like two thirds that are positive and one third was kind of negative. Just like, you know, Motoya was saying, I think the most important thing there is to have not only standards, but the regulatory aspect of that is going to be really important. So, and I agree with them that it's not just the role of the United Nations, to come up with these standards, um, I do think it takes you know a good combination of business and government to work together, and members of society, frankly, to be able to enforce um, these kind of regulatory aspects. Because AI is fascinating. I mean, there's so many things that are happening even post COVID, or even you know it's still happening um, when it comes to healthcare as well. So AI is an area, and as you know, Gary. Um, you as, as an MD, you know that there's so many developments here. China, for example, has taken the lead in that specific area of artificial intelligence for a long time. So I think we can follow their lead when it comes to that aspect of it. But just like, you know, Matoya was saying, um, I think here standards and ethics are going to be really important. Growing up, um, I'll wrap it up with this. Um, my father, who was a diplomat but also studied law, would always say to me, look, Hakan, you can have all the laws in the world. But the most important thing is actually enforcement. How do you actually enforce these laws, right? So from an international perspective, from a PPP perspective, I do think there are great opportunities out there uh, for businesses and government to work together. Um, is there a will to do that? Just like when it comes to climate change and sustainability and even artificial intelligence, if there's a will, 
I think that's the success. Uh, that's the recipe for success going forward. If we don't do that, I think, you know, we're going to keep on kind of going through these challenges and there's going to be meeting after meeting, you know, at COP and other places, and there's going to be no impact. And that I think is key. How do we actually measure change and impact rather than just having get togethers where people just come together and talk about these incredible goals, but then nothing comes out of it, or at least it seems like nothing comes out of it. I don't want to be too critical, but I think focusing on that impact part is going to be key as well. Thank you, Gary. I'd like to wrap it up here so that my other esteemed panelists can also take it from there. Thank you, Hakan. Um, I, and I resonate with a lot of what you said. I think you know, some of the, the you're already seeing some confluence of comments from Matoya and yourself around the need for trusts and goodwill and good intention in, in this effort. Um, and ultimately that in order for anything to really be achieved, there needs to be some sort of tangible goal that, and metrics around that. So there are some, some things we're hearing right out of the gate. Um, we see uh, Daniela uh, Hermann, who's uh, joining us from T uh, Toppen Age in Switzerland. She flashes in and out, um, but I'm going to turn it to, to Daniela. Daniela, maybe you could just um, introduce yourself and uh, what your organization does and then make your opening comments on this topic. Yes, thank you so much. Um, is it very noisy in the background? Gary, is it okay? Can you hear me? You're, you're coming in and out. Um, but That's such try. an unfortunate, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. So it's technical. All right. I just will keep it very short. Uh, I founded a Topon group that is moving capital in the right direction. It's developing economic. Does anyone else have, are, are you hearing intermittent words? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So maybe um, let me um, move over. Uh, I'm sorry, Danielle. Maybe we'll, we'll come back. Um, <laughs> we'll move to Prachi. Uh, who, um, and then we'll come, we'll go to Fernando, hopefully um, be, by the time we get to uh, to you, uh, then this will be resolved. We'll, we'll see. But Prachi Kale, who's joining us as the director of the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation in the United States, has some thoughts around who needs to manage the money, who will ultimately be, you know, driving the economic piece of a PPP. Um, and so in playing off of some of the topics we already heard from Hakan and Matoya, uh, maybe you can give some, give us some of your thoughts on, on that topic. Sure. Thank you, Gary. Um, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everyone, from wherever you are. Glad to be here. Um, I think I I'll just sort of extend what you know my panelists before me uh were saying around you know just it's the enforcement it's the action right and then who's really going to look at it i mean we come from a business background wherever you put money time and resources there's always the question of effective execution what does it take to keep multiple initiatives going together uh, there's also the mention of change, right? Uh, and we're talking about people's will to change, the level of trust. I mean, these for me are classic sort of change management, complex, you know, change management issues. Um, and here really it's around, you know, an existential risk we're looking at, right? And then the other aspect around who are the people who are involved is everybody at the table from an inclusivity perspective, um, and, and what I'm putting forth here is, you know, these are skill sets from a business standpoint that we are um, are supposed to have as strategists, as technologists, as, you know, um, as product developers, all soup to nuts. I think it's it's really important to think about where we're spending resources. What are the programs? How are the programs performing? you know, wherever we're pouring in this money right now, I don't think there's a lack of resources, there's a lack of intention. Um, it's the it's the coordination, it's the planning, it's the proper execution of it. And, um, and frankly, communicating progress as well, right? I mean, it just someone said, just looking to the UN to drive that uh, is not probably the, the, the best way to do it. There are opportunities for business and governments to even partner together, you know, in a public-private setting. Uh, to really drive those goals forward 
in a in a meaningful and impactful manner. Great, thanks for those opening comments. So I do have to say this is pretty entertaining to watch the, yes. the video part of this. <laughs> it took me only three devices to get on today. So, <laughs> so but I, I also like seeing everyone large and small coming flashing back and forth. I mean, hopefully, so. hopefully <laughs> nobody has like epilepsy episodes you know, after this. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, let me let me kind of move back and see if Daniela can can join us uh, now, and then I'll go to Fernando thereafter. But uh, Daniela, try try again to see if you can um, provide your comments. I will try. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Maybe if she stops the video. Well, oh, maybe. Yeah, great suggestion. Can you hear me then? Hello. Yes. 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 Is it too loud in the background? Oh. Is it fine? Oh, well. That was good. Good suggestion. It seemed to work for about 15 seconds. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Where is that? Bad? Maybe two, two seconds. <laughs> two seconds. Yeah. Yeah. I was, being, I was trying to be generous. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll come back again. But Fernando, um, with that great uh, attempted suggestion, fixing our technical issues, uh, could could you give us some thoughts, your your thoughts around this on this topic of uh, PPPs and how they might help us to achieve the SDGs? Yes, uh, thank you, Gary, for the for the introduction, and thank you everybody for being in this uh, truly international panel, as as uh, Prachi already said. Uh, well, I, I'm a philosopher by education. I I, I did a PhD in, in Germany, actually near to to Switzerland in Constance. And um, I, and I teach business ethics and corporate governance, and, and I eventually ended up as a, a kind of philosophy in house for for Vitalis. And I also have a digital magazine, uh, uh, this, this kind of social entrepreneurship, which is costing me well, the little money that I have. But um, <laughs> taking the comments of of the previous panelists, I I agree with uh, first with with um, Motoya. In the sense that the idea that that you need the the UN to to coordinate this kind of activities, I I, I think they they could have an is, is inspiring role, but managing it is is another question. And um, coming from Mexico, when we think about these private public associations, we we tend to think on, on corruption. And uh, yes. something that, that is, I, I, I'm surely that that's not the point, but it's always complicated because it's uh, typical for Mexico to thrive because of good connections with the government, not because of your performance and, and uh, your your KPIs and, uh, and the like. So uh, I, I think it's better to have clear, clear goals and, and the tasks, the role of government, the role of, of private business differentiated and then try to try to see what what can you do together and uh, one key point is is what uh, 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 Esnack mentioned uh, uh, Hacken and that, that is a a, a a a sound and robust regulatory framework good laws and and good execution uh, that that is not the case in Mexico the framework is uh, the, the laws are are confused and are very well intentioned, but the, the execution is it's tend, tend to be bad. And uh, with good laws, you could have a better business ecosystem and it's easier to thrive. Uh, the other thing is, I would say, because of the, the need of trust, as Gary pointed out, uh, you need transparency, transparency in the collaboration. So it has to be clear why a certain business, uh, it's collaborating with the government in a, in a particular project. And I think that it's a good idea when it, it's related with the core business of, of the given business enterprise. And, and it's not only some, some kind of charity or, or a social commitment that has nothing to do with business. So for example, if you are talking about a beverage uh, company, well, you have to think about the, the, the sugar content in the soft drink. And, and if you are talking about financial institutions, well, the, the management good management of sound management of, of funds and, and and money and criteria sound management of risks uh, but, but by doing their work the the businesses 
help to achieve these, these goals or, or to walk in the direction of these goals. I, I have to say, I see no problem in failing with the goals. That's, that's the story of, of every human, win, mean, uh, human being. And so when I was writing my dissertation, I was always trying to, to get it in a defined a, a schedule. And it, it was always impossible and it didn't matter because you have to keep walking and it doesn't matter if you don't achieve the goal. I don't know what was this idea of 2030. When I heard about it, I thought, well, then 2030 will come and they will say, well, we need another 50 years or, or 30. That's, that's no problem to, to achieve peace, justice and strong institutions. That, that's the work of a life. And each generation ha have to, to work for these goals once and again. And, and sometimes we will fail, sometimes we will have setbacks. The idea is to continue in the right direction. The, uh, for me, it's, it's no problem to fail the schedule. The, the schedule was a self-imposed uh, arbitrary time that, that we don't have to comply with. And that, that will be my first participation. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. And I, I, I think you're exactly right that um putting a timeline or putting a time goal on the goals. Obviously these developed out of the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs became the SDGs, you know, in 2015. So these were, you know, they're, they're always aspirational and there probably is a certain amount of um, understanding when they're formed that these will be directional and not be absolute because they're very lofty. Um, and some of them, some are, in opposition with the others in, in some instances. So trying to find, you know, trying to resolve conflicts between goals is, is, is challenging in itself. But I think, you know, what I hear from you and we also heard from uh, actually the other panelists around when you get, when you get companies or, or private entities collaborating with public entities, we always need to guard to assure that the, uh, that there is goodwill and that the interests of the goals are at the heart and it's and there aren't some corrupt um, yeah. um, reasons why people are are collaborating. And, and, and that's always going to be difficult because in some, in, you know, in, in many regards, there are conflicting goal, uh, objectives of each organization. And, and, and but being explicit on what the intentions are is probably very important at the outset. Um, so let's try Daniela again. I don't know if we all turn off our <laughs> videos if we can get her, but I don't know. Thank you. I, hello, hello. Yeah, I'm going to turn off my video and see if we can get Daniela. Yeah, maybe we can try that. Let's see. Yeah. Hello, hello. Can you hear me, everyone? Okay, Daniela, maybe you can try. Hello, hello. I see a floating balloon. <laughs> I was like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, it looks like Daniela's messaging. Okay. I, th I think it must be the connectivity that she has there. Yeah. Well, infrastructure in Switzerland is, or... is not the best. No. No, no, that, was, that was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, but not when you're on the not can, when you're on the mountain. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Unfortunately, well, we'll, we'll keep trying. Um, but in, in any case, um, uh, so you know, I, I think everyone has really good comments. Um, Around, to, to open up and as we do, as I said, we hear certain themes um, that are that are flowing through here. Um, I think Hakan uh, gave a good example of where uh, PPPs have been tried and where there is some, um, let's say, movement in the direction of the intention is, is occurring. Does anyone else have experience that you've actually seen examples of PPPs that have worked um, that that could advance. I, I have some, but interested in the panel's um, uh, uh, experience. I haven't seen a lot. Uh, and like Fernando has said, in Japan, PPPs are almost synonymous with corruption here in, here in Japan. Everybody is very skeptical. Um, 
And so I think you can find an easier time um, looking for failures. However, I was fascinated by, by the success of SpaceX uh, because it has a lot to do with their collaboration with NASA. I mean, I don't know the details, but at least uh, it, it, it seems to be that uh, the success of SpaceX uh, would not be as, as significant as it is if it were not for the collaboration of NASA. And I'm very interested to know um, how that was achieved and why it was successful. Of course, we don't know the whole picture, but why, at least for now, it seems more successful than many other PPP projects that I've seen. I think there's a, there was a pain point there that NASA realized that it was falling behind, you know, with Russia and, you know, China and other countries as well. And they realized that, because I've covered this a little bit when I was even in the news industry, um, so for them, understanding and realizing that there was a gap and then seeing, you know, Elon Musk and SpaceX and the vision there, I think, and that's actually, I think, indicative of when there is a success story, it's that both sides are actually coming together with shared goals and vision. I think it happens frequently. For example, I worked on, you know, cybersecurity um, and the public and private sectors, you know, coming together there. There really is a will. Um, but sometimes it's just because of bureaucracy and other reasons, just the execution aspect of it really, again, just mm -hmm. doesn't come through. And then more importantly, perhaps people don't understand, for example, what cybersecurity actually means and how it impacts all of us as well. And it's like, I hate to say it, but sometimes it's not sexy enough. People just don't get it. Whereas, you know, artificial intelligence, we just think it's a bunch of robots, mm -hmm. right? Taking over the world. Um, so it's, you know, more... Thank you for advertising. I am literally just running a company around design thinking for cybersecurity, and we're doing exactly that around cybersecurity is not glamorous enough, entertaining enough. Right. Um, you know, so working a lot with that. And, and ironically, it's a trust aspect, right? You're talking about zero trust from an identity standpoint, but the same people have to trust each other to execute. Correct. So it's paradoxical, right? So the thinking has to be collective, the execution has to really separate every individual identity, not the person in and of itself, you know, um, altogether. So, so thank you. I was very excited to hear that comment. No, absolutely. And we can connect further and, and yeah, chat about some of the absolutely. kind of common design cyber. <laughs> mutual areas of interest as well. But I mean, it's just, you know, again, it's, it's hard for sometimes for citizens or people to digest absolutely. that and understand it. And there has to be a better understanding. I mean, my goodness here, in the U.S., when the pipeline, you know, was hit, you know, and yeah. for days, you know, there's all the issues with gas. Now the gas prices are higher, but that's yeah. a you know separate story. But yeah. you know, we saw the impact firsthand. But there's so much impact from cybersecurity and mitigating cybersecurity risks that we're not seeing. So sometimes yeah. I think again, both public and private partnerships they want to work on this, but again, it's just they're having a hard time selling the story. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing is because it's intangible outcomes, really, if nothing happens, it's great. If it happens, it's really bad. Right. Um, you know, so people are not able to tangibly experience uh, that. And, you know, so so tell the story. So same thing as I talked about before, what's the ROI? People are pumping money into these industries without a tangible, measurable way to to determine where that money is going. You know, is it corruption? Is it actually working? Um, and cybersecurity is a classic example. Another one, I think, just tacking on to the SpaceX, and I'm glad you brought that up, is also industry academia partnerships have worked for years, right? Um, and how, again, we don't know what the motivations behind that are, you know, what is the university needing, but definitely public universities and private sector has, you know, in the past really partnered in a good way. Um, you know, the well-known private institutions obviously have you know, big endowments and things like that. But from a public standpoint, too, there's a lot, um, you know, a lot of good opportunities and lessons to be learned from those kind of models as well. Sure. Yeah, in my in my area, I, so I've spent my entire career in healthcare. Um, started as a, as a practicing physician, um, moved into industry uh, where I spent most of my career. And then, but I was at the World Economic Forum for a couple of years as the head of health. Um, and in health, there's actually, there are more examples of, of PPP. I think you know, Operation Warp Speed was a great example um, where uh, the government um, industry and actually contract research organizations worked together to find a vaccine. And I've seen the same around Ebola 
um, Johnson and Johnson with UPS, um, the Gates Foundation working on that, uh, and, and the and government in Africa. Uh, I've seen the same in. Uh, I was telling Matoya yesterday um, in the south of India, um, Novo mm-hmm. Nordisk. Um, uh, one of the diagnostics companies and one of the regional Indian governments with the healthcare system, private system in, in India worked on trying to get at diabetes. Um, and so, and, and, and in, so I think when the objective is clear and concrete and people, uh, let's say organizations interests align, it's, it's much easier to achieve those. And maybe health is, is kind of ripe for that, but some of these other ones, that, you know, zero hunger, no poverty, which are the top two on the SDGs. Um, those are lofty goals, but it feels as though perhaps someone's going to, quote, have to lose in order for someone to to benefit. And so mm-hmm. just wanted to get the, the panel's thoughts on that, where you see conflict of the SDG with, say, the inherent um, objectives of uh, especially the private sector. I have a quick thought on that very quickly. I mean, I agree with you, healthcare, I mean, and especially with coronavirus, the vaccine, I mean, Pfizer and BioNTech coming together, you know, it was based on, you know, uh, you know, Turkish German, you know, BioNTech, you know, really developing an excellent friendship with the Greek American, you know, from Pfizer and really building on that relationship. And when others were not as aggressive, they went for it right 24 seven which is an excellent example of partnership there. But even there, there are inequities, right? the way that the vaccines were, of course, distributed around the world. I mean, it's not a perfect world in that case. So there are still challenges um, even in that area, I think. But I do agree with you, Gary, that that's actually been a success story. <clears throat> and again, from the beginning, what we said is if there's a will um, and hopefully some regulatory aspect to make sure that we can at least minimize some of these inequities and what my esteemed co- panelists called corruption, which I agree with as well. If we can reduce corruption and be have better ethical standards, I think we can do better. Yeah, I think the word that comes to my mind is accountability. I think with the will, right. the accountability has to be there, right? And again, as I mentioned, and not to say you know private corporations are free of any kind of corruptionary kind of you know nefarious activities, but I think the that accountability structure is so it's pretty well incorporated. Um, and, and so that's sort of what I was thinking, I mean, what I was envisioning transports over to the public-private partnerships in that format. And I would add on transparency as well. I mean, it could be synonymous with accountability, but yeah. um, this is about public money. This is about... Exactly. This is a, these are about projects where, you know, generally people would support, whereas many other PPPs that we've seen, like building building bridges or power plants, um, they don't necessarily um, deserve um, transparency, and that's why corruption was was easy to occur, whereas this is something that everybody would agree. Or, um, so, you know, people will be very aware of how the money is used and how the project is implemented. So the transparency is the key. I'm not sure the UN is very good at that, Mm -hmm. but uh, it's not right. So, uh, <laughs> but whoever it is, UN or, or whoever, it, it, they need to um, um, achieve this with um, with a great deal of transparency. Yeah, I mean, so so the the one question really that I've seen with PPPs, in addition to the factors that all of you have said, um, proper will, um, honesty. Uh, making sure there's accountability, you know, proper management. It's just how do, how do these things come together? And so maybe Fernando, you have some thoughts um, around like how what's the hierarchy? What's the organization structure? If, if we're trying to achieve these goals, and I agree with you that achieving the goals is not really either possible or really the goal. It's 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 moving in a direction. Now, how do you go from the macro to the the tangible? Well, I guess one problem is that you cannot cover the whole spectrum. So either you decide for the macro or the middle size or or, or the the concrete, the very local. And um, as as uh, Motoya was talking about SpaceX, I think that's the macro. 
or, or cyber security, it's, it's obvious that no government is in a position to, to, to deliver all the cyber security measures that, that a society needs. But there is also the very local, the very concrete, also related with security. I, I was thinking about crime prevention because I worked for a while in crime, pre crime prevention. And there you need you need a, a, a symbiosis of working together between businesses and, and, and the police. But but it's a very local police, and you go to the to the business owners and and, and some corporations and say, can can we train your employees? Can we show them how to prevent crime or how to conduct themselves? On the streets, so very uh, at a very local, and and with not not uh, that vast amount of of money uh, there, so less less opportunity to, to corruption. And and the other question, which is a very hard one, is this hierarchy, this conflict of of goals. Well, I guess if it's not in the core business of the business, then it's suspicious. So so uh, because why would would they do something that is not aligned with their business and interest and and, and strategy? So there I will say, well, first of all, let's see this, this kind of, of uh, altruism. I'm always suspicious of altruism. I guess that, 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 that simply is, is, not a, is not a proper motivation. So you have to see what, what's in, in it for, for the business and what's in it for, for the government or, or the public institution. Uh, and then try to do what is near to your core. If you're a cybersecurity expert, then, then it, what, what you have to be doing is cybersecurity, not, not advocating for other goals that are, that are good in themselves, but unrelated with your business practice. Good, good, all good points. I know we're in the we're in the final few minutes of the session. I wanted to see if, if anyone from the panel had any sort of parting wisdom for, I would take, I would take questions from the audience, but it looks like the audience has sort of been popping in and out uh, during the, the session. So I don't think we have any specific questions from the audience. I think that sometimes that ends up being one of the more interesting parts of these panels. But any any parting comments, wisdom, things you've taken from each other um, during today's session? Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on what Fernando said about, you know, business interests and altruism. Absolutely, there's, you know, there should be the question, there should, that's an absolute right question. I, I see uh, a, a company's corporate responsibility priorities really an extension of their values, not necessarily, you know, or in addition to their business interests. I don't think they're mutually exclusive, right? So what you accomplish as a business and what your values and your mission and your vision for your company are and how are you taking what you're earning through that and, you know, putting away a portion towards any altruistic interest, you know, of something that you may not even drive. I think that exists largely. Um, again, I grew up in India. I'm working in the U.S. So I've seen both sides. Right. So so I acknowledge what you're saying. And, you know, if I in, in developing countries, especially or almost developed countries, um, you know, that really is a big question. Um, and then, you know, what does corporate responsibility mean? Why are we picking the goals that we have? Right. Environment in general should be every business's responsibility. Social equity, access, inclusivity should be every business's um, uh, priorities and, and a reflection in their values within the company as well as what they're doing for the society. So just wanted to extend, I don't, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but there are opportunities um, to, to explore. I, I agree with that. I mean, it's like, that's what I mentioned, like the business roundtable earlier, shareholders, yeah. stockholders, you know, can we actually implement that with SDGs as well? I know it's lofty goal. Um, you know, it's not just about Kumbaya and, you know, all everybody coming and getting yeah. together, but I do think we need to set those kind of goals to have any kind of hopefully future impact and change. And I think, you know, like I said in my first um, statement that, um, you know, in, a, in, in the ecosystem of private equity, that's been happening. There's a there's an investor who's highly conscious and the managers are highly conscious. And because of them, the invested companies are highly conscious. And then you have this, this share of value. But however, um, oh, Okay, I got it. Uh, so, so one of one of the uh, one of the problems that we we face as an international investor is that the 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 consciousness depends on which country you are in. So, Context. in some some countries are more conscious, That's and, and they they live in that sort of sense of value. While if you go to another country, it's very different. 
Like, yeah. you know, it, just take Asia, for example. Japan yes. is highly conscious because we are, we are conscious of what other people are doing, what other countries are saying. But if you invest in China, it's a different level, right? Uh, so um, we, if you have that, um, you know, what you think is de facto standard, uh, that you think is shared internationally, that it's, it's, it, it may not be true for other countries. So that's something that yeah, uh, we, we always face. I issue. think the word context is also very important, um, what you were saying, right? So again, same thing, we're talking about poverty. Poverty means very different things between India and the U.S. and Latin America yes. or you know, other Asian countries. Um, so, the, so that context is really, really important. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we're at time. So I do want to thank all the panelists for your comments, your participation today. And uh, for those who will be watching this on, we've recorded the session. I hope that everyone found it uh, interesting and took something from it. I know I did. So have a good rest of the day. Bye, Thanks. Bye. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.